Good afternoon. I think we are live. Welcome to this very special Daily Maverick webinar. Very honored to have with me here my colleague, the perpetual thorn in Ace Magashule's side, Peter Louis Marburg from our Scorpio Investigative Journalism Unit. Thank you very much for being with us here, Peter Louis. I know this is a busy week for you. It has been, but uh, I wouldn't spend it, my time any other way. Love our insiders. And <laughs> looking forward to this chat with you, Rebecca. Thanks for, for putting this together. Absolute pleasure. Um, on the note of insiders, this webinar and most of Daily Maverick, much of Daily Maverick's work is brought to you by Daily Maverick Insiders, which is our community of readers who give us hugely appreciated monthly support. Now, we know that many of you watching this webinar right now are not Daily Maverick insiders, in which case I have to ask why. It is really one of the simplest and easiest things you can do to do your part to hold power to account in this country, and that is to make a small monthly contribution of whatever amount you see fit to Daily Maverick, which really helps sustain our work and the kind of work done by Peter Louis, which leads to the events that we've seen this week. And those events, of course, the issuing of a warrant for the ANC Secretary General, Ace Magashule, something that has been kind of rumored to be in the works for some time. We are now finally seeing action on it. And I think probably nobody is more relieved than Peter Louis as somebody who has delved deeper than anyone outside the NPA, I would say, into the world, the fiefdom of Ace Magashule in the Free State with the publication of his book in 2019, Gangster State. Peter Louis is, I think, the... Um, the unrivaled expert on all things is Magashule, and I think it is very much his work that is playing a huge part in bringing us to the events of this week. So let's jump right in, Peter Louis. Can you explain what we believe that Ace Magashule will be charged with when he appears in court? Yes. Um, so I haven't seen a charge sheet, Rebecca, but I do have some insight into what the charges might relate to. So Mr. Mahashule would be charged with, the background is this quarter billion rand asbestos audit contract, you know, 255 million rand was funneled from the Department of Human Settlements in the province to these, um, you know, companies. It was a joint venture between two companies to execute an asbestos audit deal uh, or project, which essentially came down to counting groups in the province. We know it cost far, far, far less than that, probably only around 7 million rand. So Mr. Mahashule, as I um, wanted in some detail to kind of showcase in Gangster State, was very close to the financial dealings around this contract. So you would repeat that if three PAs, you know, come and essentially divert some of the, what must be or is alleged to be the proceeds of a corrupt contract towards certain individuals. So that would trigger, that would have financial or, or criminal implications in, um, or that falls under certain pieces of legislation in South Africa. The Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act is one, that's PRICA. Uh, there might be some money laundering issues that would fall under the Prevention of Organized Crime Act, that's POCA. And then stepping back from his participation in diverting what is essentially illicit funds. There are also criminal implications. I think this is very important. You know, you don't always have to take a kickback or bribe to be uh, for, for one to be um, arrested or charged uh, in relation to these kind of deals. Uh, the Public Finance Management Act, the PFMA, also places stringent responsibilities on senior politicians, senior government leaders when they handle government affairs. I mean, they, they are at the helm of a province like the Free State. So his um, ability or otherwise to curtail the unfolding of a corrupt contract may, may, all, uh, may, may also trigger some criminal offences that fall under the PFMA. And, so let me, let me just yeah. stop you there for a second, Peter Louis, mm. if I might, because we've heard this narrative coming from ACE and now from the ANC as well, that what he is being charged with is a failure to exercise oversight. Now, we mm. know that that in itself is not a criminal offence or every member of parliament virtually would be behind bars by now. Mm. So can you just take that apart for us a little bit? I mean, that is just not true, is it? 
Yeah. Look, so uh, I'm sure we're going to delve into some of the political ramifications and uh, trickery that we've seen at play from yeah. certain you know, political groupings. But I think that is an attempt to downplay the seriousness of the current developments. A you know, failure to provide oversight certainly sounds le uh, much less yeah. um, impactful and, and compelling than you know, mentioning phrases like corruption or money laundering. Um, and, and so on. Um, so it's, it certainly would not be cordoned off around only those kind of conduct. I think what well, they are alluding to, um, perhaps somewhat, um, um, you know, without really phrasing it in the correct legal terminology, is some of the transgressions that fall under PFMA, you know, where the, where the Public Finance Management Act compels a government leader to handle government affairs and government funds, especially in a prudent and responsible manner. So I think they have um, largely focused or sort of over um, magnified a small element of the charges, the set of charges, to make it seem that this only this component of the PFMA um, is, is what the NPA is um, trapping him for. But it, it certainly it would be much wider than that. Right. So there's an element of truth in that. But what he is being charged with is much more active than merely standing by while corruption took place. Yeah, definitely. Um, Peter Louis, can you give us a brief rundown of, of Magashule's co-accused in this matter? Yes. So Mr. Magashule would now be accused number seven, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So we'd, we'd recall that about two months ago, the, the first arrest is that long ago. And at 2020, is with all of our chronological but, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, seven individuals were apprehended on the asbestos matter. That includes businessman Edwin Sodi. Um, I mentioned, mentioned him first because he would probably kind of be viewed as accused number one on the business side of things. You know, there's the government side of things and the business side of things. So Edwin Sodi is one half of the joint venture that has secured the contract. Um, he's, he's, uh, he ran a company called Black End Consulting, and that company was in a joint venture with Diamond Hill Trading, which was run by Egon Pampani, who unfortunately met his fate uh, with a, a duo of assassin, assassins in Santon in 2017, kind of at the tail end of the asbestos matter. So you have Edwin Stody, then there's also a, a grouping of or a couple of business people who fall under him. So... The, the money trickled from the joint venture down to a subcontractor and then a sub-subcontractor and a sub-sub-subcontractor. Um, and some of these individuals have also been apprehended. So um, two, two other business people who, who got some of that money, Master Trade, uh, Silo Aradebe is the owner of a company called Master Trade. He secured a portion of the money and forwarded some of that money to a Mr. A.K. Manjike, who then also mm. forwarded the money the actual sub sub subcontractor who performed the work. So that kind of tier of um, all that, you know, that layered stack of business people that handle some of the money have all been arrested. And then on the government side of things, the head of the department, Tim Ochesi, has been arrested, um, along with some of the officials in that department, the Department of uh, Human Settlements. The last uh, political figure to mention is uh, Ms. Oli uh, Lamleli. Mm. who at one point was the mayor in Bloemfontein, um, who was, I understand, and I, I'm not too privy to what the investigating team have uncovered around her dealings, but I would I would understand, or I would guess, venture to guess, that some of the cash flows may have, probably have been passed around to an MPA or something along those lines that benefited the former mayor too. So a bit mm. of a mixed bag of you know, business people and then the government officials who oversaw this contract and sign off, sign off on it. So it's quite a cast of characters to keep track of. Um, I'm sure you saw, Peter Louis, that uh, constitutional law professor Pierre Defoss wrote on Daily Maverick today about some of the difficulties involved. And I'd like to get into mm. that a bit later. One of his points being that those at the top of corruption tend to keep their hands quite clean. Mm. In terms of just making sense of where everyone fits in, you have given us a bit of a rundown so far, but can you give us a little bit more context to the asbestos scam and how it worked? Yeah. So it was without a doubt an effort to extract money 
large amount of money from the province's cof uh, coffers with very little regard for the actual service delivery. Mm. So there's an amount of 230 million rand. It was actually intended to be 255 million rand. It became 230 million rand because there were just too many questions being asked about this contract towards the, 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 the end of it. So end of the story, 230 million rand kind of went to this joint venture. But it certainly was a scheme because we already know from a report from the Auditor General, for instance, and then later a follow-up report that, uh, confirming this from the, audit, from the public protector, it showed that the amount that they wanted to take out was predetermined. So they never decided, you know, you know what, what kind of services they were going to deliver or on how many asbestos audits or houses they were going to execute the audit. They decided, and the whole deal is structured in this manner, that they wanted to take out a good old round 255 million rand. And then analyzing the cash flows, it just becomes abundantly clear that from the outset, very little was going to be spent on actually performing this audit, but they were going to pocket the bulk of it. So you could see how the money goes to the joint venture, Blackett Consulting and Diamond Deal, pays it on to Master Trade, pays it on to um, AK Manika's company, and then finally AK Manika funnels a little bit of it to the actual service provider, while those top three, the primary contractors, pocketed what it, what it was essentially more than, you know, in excess of 200 million rand in pure, pure profit. And I think the most troubling thing to highlight about the scheme is that there was always an attention, a, a supposed intention to actually remove the asbestos, roo asbestos roofing. Mm. This, of course, never occurred. It became kind of a very murky looking contract. I had a look at it where the wording just kind of, it, it started with, um, there, there was a requirement to also remove the asbestos roofing where the later and final version of the contract kind of became that this would be phase one and they'd be paid this massive amount of money for phase one, which is only the audit. And then only later could they come in and uh, use, remove mm. the asbestos uh, roofing, which is really troubling because that means that from the outset, there was never really an intention, intention to remove harmful asbestos materials from, from those houses. So as things stand, in fact, those people are still dealing with the potential health impact of the asbestos, in addition to seeing their provincial government fleecing the, the, the state coffers. I mean, that is really quite yeah. something. Um, Peter Lou, do you have any sense, you, as I mentioned, worked just exhaustively on this and you laid it out so meticulously in Gangster State in 2019. Do you have a sense to what degree the NPA made use of your investigative work in helping to build their case? So I would guess, and I would, I, I suppose they would have had the book, you know, um, in under their, their eyes and as part of the investigation since at least April 2019. Mm. So, you know, when the book was published, because I think immediately, you know, the, the law enforcement agencies working on free set related issues became aware of the book and started looking at certain elements of it. I think that was that kind of a key juncture where, you know, previously the NPA and the Hawks were always kind of, you know, spewing the line that, you know, the media is tainted and they shouldn't go near to what's being reported in news reports and they're doing their work independently. I think at that point, thankfully, I think those law enforcement bodies realized that they could, and this is all provided for in legislation, but nothing bars a, a law enforcement body or the NPA to proactively look at the case based on their own investigations, of course, and build it out. So, you know, I, I would think that they would have had sight of the book. Um, that they certainly would have. But the important thing is then they've got to independently build a investigation and then build a prosecution. So it, it's yeah. unlike what some people might imagine incorrectly. You can't lift portions of gangster state and then present it as evidence in a court of law. You know, they, they have to very diligently. If I kind of like lay out how a X amount of money is funneled to the governing party or, you know, towards the benefit of some of Asma Hashule's ANC youth league comrades who went to Cuba and this actually happened, you know, they, they, they contact that snippet of the book and present it in court. They've got to painstakingly 
recreate that, you know, put it all together within the um, frame of an investigation and then later a prosecution. And I would imagine this is to an extent what happened with this case. And for, for all we know, and I certainly hope so, there, there might be even further indications of the implication or Mr. Makhashuri's role in the deal or certain other cash flows that I haven't even been privy to before, mm-hmm. yet just because of the fact that their powers are so much more wide-ranging than mine in terms mm-hmm. of access to information. Um, it's a question often asked, which is on the one hand very obvious, but perhaps not, um, and that is, well, why didn't you lay a charge against Ace Magashule, Peter Louis, when you found all this wrongdoing? Yeah, so that, that is always the, the question that's kind of thrown in our faces. And, you know, the, the simple answer is that doesn't happen. It simply isn't international best practice anywhere in the world, uh, including South Africa, for the investigative journalist to take it upon him or herself to then go and lay the charge. Um, it is quite sufficient, and it's quite sufficiently provided for in our legislative framework for a matter to be aired in public on a public platform in a book, in an investigative piece on Daily Maverick in a newspaper, and then for the authorities to take note and then start the investigations. Having said that, um, it's not like there's ever a shortage of complaints in any case. So frequently we see that when we publish uh, material like this, stories like this, interested parties do go and lay criminal charges, and that... What happened in the past, not only with the asbestos matter, where opposition parties and civil society bodies have laid corruption charges or, or complaints at the police in Bloemfontein, but on other cases too. So I think that that really is just a ploy um, to kind of detract from the seriousness, I think, of the allegation. I think that feeds into this narrative that, you know, if you believe it's so serious, why don't you go and lay a charge? But, you know... Actually, there, there's no shortage of such charges at police stations. It was merely actually a, a case where the law enforcement bodies for so many years just didn't act on them. Right. We're getting such great questions coming in from the audience, and I want to put as many of them to you as possible. But let me just ask some of the pre the questions I wanted to get through, uh, one of which is what happens now in terms of the time frame, in terms of what ACE is to face, the case against ACE to face? Case against us. So what physically happens now is tomorrow, there, there seems to have been, we have to keep in mind, the police and the Hawks, they don't necessarily have to always play nice and be diplomatic when there isn't a arrest warrant. They, they are quite um, capable or allowed to go to an individual's house and arrest him or her when there's an arrest warrant. In this case, but having said that, there's also provision for some back-channel um, agreement and I think this is what happened in this instance. So the the Hawks, the MPA would have signed off on the warrant. It would have been fed to the Hawks who have to physically make the arrest. And we understand that they have now notified Mr. Victor Nkwashu, who is Ace Makashuda's lawyer, that your client, you know, there isn't an arrest warrant out for him. And then they all agreed that Makashuda would go and present himself to the Hawks. That occurs on 10 o'clock tomorrow. So at 10 o'clock, he has to hand himself over to the Hawks in Bloemfontein. And then the, the first appearance uh, would, would happen shortly after that, I, I suppose, on the same afternoon, still at the Bloemfontein Magistrates Court. Mm-hmm. That is going to be a TV scrum, as discussed. I mean, there's nothing journalists like more than a photograph of the ANC Secretary General in the dock. It's going to be quite something. Peter Louis, this is obviously only one aspect of Ace Magashule's alleged crimes. Um, a lot of people in the comments asking, for instance, about the Estina, the Frieda dairy matter. Which others do you think we can hope or should hope, should expect to see action on soon? Look, so the law enforcement agencies are undoubtedly extremely, extremely busy. Um, you know, we can all see that. We've seen arrests on ESCOM matters last year. Finally, you know, some of those companies were arrested. Or some of the, the directors of some of those companies who got their hands into um, grossly inflate, inflated contracts at Medupi and Casilio, for instance. There's been arrests this year, you know, on, on a wide variety, uh, variety of issues. So they are currently working. What I would, you know, I would guess 
that obviously, you know, I think there's massive public interest in an issue like Istina, like Frieda, because it just, it really just struck such a raw nerve. And the fact that, you know, so much money could be siphoned off from a project that was supposed to uplift, you know, poor um, or emerging farmers in that province. So th this will be, you know, we have to, I, I think it definitely does feed into a risk on the NPA's conscience almost. I think they, they are aware of what issues have really riled the public to that degree. They still have to, you know, put together proper prosecution. But, you know, I think those, those kind of um, cases mm -hmm. are certainly getting attention. Estina, um, obviously issues around, you know, my colleague, Polly van Weijk's fantastic work on, you know, BBS and, and, you know, that horrific looting scheme that saw so much money drained from there. That that should surely also be getting a lot of attention. Mm. Um, Marcus Eustace Steinhoff scandal must surely just by virtue of how big and impactful it was, um, you know, and, and the damage it caused, that surely should also be one of the, the priority cases. So I, I guess this is my, a bit of my personal wish list to you, mm. uh, but um, I don't think I'd be far from wrong if I say that those cases currently are enjoying a lot of attention. The the number one question I think that everyone is asking um, is who who's next in terms of high profile arrests. Ace Magashule obviously far and away the biggest fish we've seen to go down in this iteration of the Hawks acting. Um, mm. If you had to speak, perhaps not with your fantasist hat on, but your pragmatist hat, do you think? Yeah there are high-profile scalps to come further in the near future? Um, I do. I do. I, do. I, I think the, the National Prosecuting Authority knows how important it is to finally act against, you know, somebody like the Gupta family. You know, so it's really been so instrumental in causing so much damage in the implosion of governance in this country and siphoning off billions and billions of rands. Mm. So, you know, I would expect that we, we might see some movement on that soon. And that would um, almost necessarily then also implicate a, a, a group of other top-level officials too, because their dealings, especially in the free state, for instance, we know that involves somebody like Mr. Ben Zizwane. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, I do not have actual insight into that matter specifically, but... What I do know is, is that that case has been receiving a lot of attention and that given sort of how much time has lapsed since, that they surely should be approaching, um, you know, conclusion on that matter soon. Mm. There's certainly been speculation, as you know, among us at Daily Maverick that, you know, Mosebenz is one, Nomvula Mokonyane, as a result also of the testimony given at the Zondo, has to surely be in the sights of law enforcement as well. Um, let's talk a bit about the political implications of what's happening, Peter Louis, which is also what a lot of people want to know about. Uh, we've seen the ANC top six meet, we've seen Jesse Duarte release a statement, uh, in which I think how to, how, how to put this, um, diplomatically. Not exactly, uh, a, a strong condemnation of Magashina, not exactly a strong rebuke in terms of corruption. What do you make of what is happening within the ANC currently and the impact this is likely to have? Hmm. Look, I can only imagine that they are very well aware of the fact that if they pull the trigger on that resolution of theirs to, you know, to, to enforce or to force individuals implicated in corruption to actually step down, that it will have massive ramifications for the party. Because it is a party that, you know, across the board harbors so, so many individuals who are directly implicated in, you know, corruption and other forms of malfeasance. So I can only imagine, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall at that uh, top six meeting last night where, where Mr. Mahashule's fate was supposedly discussed or not. Certainly it would have come up. Yeah. But I can only imagine that the reason that they didn't, because you know, I think South Africa is kind of, you know, people who are following politics are, Collectively aghast at, you know, the parties now had the opportunity. It's, it's set its own boundaries and rules around this. Nasrik yeah. very clearly again reaffirmed that there is a particular policy 
that is in place for people embroiled in corruption scandals. And at this juncture, we're not even at scandal level anymore, allegations or a book. It's somebody who's been, you know, arrested or there's a warrant out and will be charged for corruption. And yet still this re resolution isn't being enforced. So my reading would be that there's some sort of a agreement within all of them that if they do now go and pull that trigger, it'll possibly cause the, the entire card house to collapse. Right. Then everybody's going to point to everybody and, and, and ask for that resolution to become applicable to you. And we can, I mean, <laughs> I, I had a bit of a relook at the top six just the other day. Just kind of like, I was wondering, like, who's actually, let's just take the top six. I mean, you've got Guerim Antashe, who's had a fence built for him by Gustasa. We've got Jesse Duarte and long running stories of the Gupta family. Mm -hmm. We've got Paul Matile and those whisperings of the Alex mob and whatever occurred around that. And being the treasurer general is almost by default going to put you in the way of some extremely dodgy dealings. Um, we've got Didi Mabuza, who has been alleged to have been as much of an alleged gangster as Ace Mahashule. You know, so that kind of like almost <laughs> leaves Ace Mahashule as a sole individual in the top six who's not been linked to that kind of conduct. You know, obviously, certainly there's been those rumors about party funding and all those problematic stuff, but I'm, mm. I'm talking about the pillaging of state coffers and so on. So, That's a really um, sobering litany you've just given us in terms of the top six, I must say. But we also do know, to be fair, Peter Louis, that there have been signs in the kind of political ecosystem that ACE is becoming increasingly isolated when it comes to enjoying the support of significant bodies. We're not talking about youth league groupies right. here in the free state or whatever. There are signs that there is a move away from yeah. Mahashule, from the fight back faction. Definitely. Look, I've kind of always viewed a lot of his support as being a very carefully manufactured thing. So when, when you saw at my book launch, for instance, in April last year in Santin, I, I did not take that as or read it as a grouping of people who came there of their own accord. It's kind of ground -well support of people who really feel that strongly about ACE that they needed to go and make a showing. It was such a carefully orchestrated event with the placards kind of all looking the same. But, you know, you can't be left with this idea that it's it's people who genuinely sort of believe in him and fight for him. And mm. it'll be once again, you know, we're kind of like watching unfolding events tomorrow, A, as kind of political drama, and it's all kind of very interesting. But B, it's going to be once again be a kind of a litmus test for how powerful he really still is in the organization and in his own yeah. province. Um, kind of adding to what you've said, I think, is that we have to keep in mind that at no juncture ever, and especially not now, was he universally loved and supported in the free state even, mm. never mind in the rest of the country. You know, there's always right. been these factions in the ANC who've kind of like met their demise against him and hated, hated him for having captured not only the province's coffers, but also the party. Um, you know, though that kind of largely to an extent it formed Coke back in the day. And right. then, um, within the Brazil walked out of the party. And then Dukwana and those individuals are very vocally opposed to Asma Khashoggi. So I think it's going to be very difficult for him to rally up broad universal support, not only in the party, but also obviously across um, you know, the, all sectors of, of society in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I just I do not see that kind of, not, not the kind of support that, for instance, Jacob Zuma enjoyed initially around the arms deal uh, prosecution. Well, we know, too, that Ace Magashule has conveniently said, please don't come to court with banners with my name on it, which possibly is a preemptive way of allowing for the lack of support. Um, mm. Peter Louis, let's try and get through one last issue before we head for the questions, and that is the question posed by um, Pierre de Foss on Daily Maverick today, which is the chances of a successful prosecution. It was quite a sobering account by... Peter Foss pointing out that it is very, very difficult often to, to secure mm. corruption prosecutions in cases like this. Um, one of the reasons being that often you need literally a witness. You need a Shabir Sheikh secretary mm. saying, I saw him take the money or whatever. What are the chances in a case like this that we have those necessary elements to see a Magashule actually behind bars? Yeah, and so I, I still, <laughs> I'm going to have a bit of a biased opinion because it's it's kind of, to, in a sense, 
my baby. You know, I've kind of dealt with it, what I named the ego files. I've sifted through, you know, quite a, a big trove of documentation and ex- uh, spreadsheets and emails linking them to the contract. So you have that element of his involvement where he, through a proxy, um, you know, Moradi Shaloto was his PA, asks for explicitly on behalf of a boss, the premier, to divert what should surely be viewed as a proceeds of a corrupt contract, you know, so illicit funds towards third parties. And, you know, I think that is pretty strong. I think I must say, once again, that, you know, we all read things differently. I think Pierre de Force's piece is excellent today. I think the, the headline is just kind of out of touch with the, the content of the article. I got a, a, a different sense. I think quite, he kind of went out to prove quite the contrary, that it's, not the NPA that she'd really be sweating at the moment, but rather Ace Mahashule, yeah. because the force goes into quite a lot of detail to essentially say that our law doesn't require you to put the kickback back in your pocket or get the car or get the house or any other form of illicit gratification. But if you are privy to a process where you direct unlawful funds or corrupt funds towards friends or families, whatever the case might be, you are complicit. And then that, I believe, having seen the emails and sort of the, the cash flows, I believe that is what, what uh, manifested around that contract. So there is, in your view, a paper trail, a strong evidentiary basis for this case. I, I do think so. I think so. And, you know, always certainly bagging a Section 204 witness would be mightily valuable. And I, once again, you know, I've, I've got no idea what's been happening behind the scenes in terms of securing that. But th- that would certainly, I mean, if we, if they could get one of the officials who were made to sign off on these deals uh, to, to implicate Asma Hashule and say that, you know, uh, although it's the Free State Department of Human Settlements, which supposedly operates in isolation from the Department of the Premier, there was this undue influence exerted on us from the Premier's office, from Mahashule, to make sure that, you know, these payments were signed off on. These, there's a question here about the news that Ace Magashule's PA was interviewed by the FBI recently in the USA, where she is currently. What do we know about that? What's the implications of that? Yeah, so there's been so much speculation around that, but I've actually, I understand that it actually relates to the, the Pirniev painting case. Right. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about that, because I know for many yeah. people it's one of Ace Magashula's, it's one of their favorite alleged crimes mm-hmm. of Ace Magashula, shall I say. Yeah. So Morwadi Shalota was interviewed by the FBI, I understand, because Ricardo Mittler was the recipient of this Pirniev painting. Um, it was Ace Magashula's bodyguard down in Bloemfontein. Um, she had to, was made to, I think, sign off on a letter, basically. It kind of um, <clears throat> allowed him to take the, the item, which is a state property, of course, out of that office. So I would suppose she would be brought back here at some juncture, hopefully to testify as to that. But yeah, just kind of a broad sort of background. There are these paintings, and I understand it's not only one. Um, I think that's been written before. And I have to keep in mind what's been written and what's not been written. But I'm not sure that has been before actually Peter Louis, but I'm taking notes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd, I'd venture to say there's a painting that definitely went missing. That's okay. the PDF the painting that's been recovered subsequently. But then there's also speculation or indications that it's only one among several valuable paintings that the Free State Province owns. Look, it's, it's got a wonderful art collection. <laughs> there are Maggie Lopes and Tierneyfs and Winsires and all sorts of fantastic, you know, uh, paintings. That, that it's, that, that the state owns there. And I just understand that the, the catalog, the, there's not a very good account of where all these paintings are apparently. So there's, there's much work to be done still on, in that regard. There might be some lovely old Maggie Lopes and things hanging on the walls of all manner of people in South Africa that we, that we don't even know about. I understand from Netwerk 24 that, um, Ace Marashule's comment on the matter was that he didn't know if PNF was a painting or a person. It's not a rock solid defense, but. Um... Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get through a number of other questions here. Some are unfortunately, I think, a bit um, 
Dangerous territory, Christian Liebenberg asking who killed Igor Mpambani? That is a, a sticky mm. one, isn't it? Yeah, that's a question that still haunts me too. Um, it's so strange, actually. So Igor Mpambani was obviously part and parcel to this corruption scandal. You know, along with Sodi, he, he drove it. He was an architect and, you know, with the officials they planned to or concocted to get this money out of the, the province. But as a subject matter, you know, as a, as a character in my book, one, one becomes quite fond of one's characters. Mm. And, you know, obviously you never make light of the fact that somebody's murdered in South Africa, regardless of whatever transgressions, alleged or not, they're embroiled in. And I've always wondered about Igor Bambani and actually what happened then, whether we'll ever see a rest on that case. Um, the last I checked, I, I do try to check into that case. It's a difficult case. It's strange. Mm. It bound from the Santon police station to Bedford View, SAPS, to the head office in Gauteng a couple of times. And kind of just logistically, it was difficult. For some reason, it just bounces from one IO to the next. I don't know what is going on with that case. All I know is that nobody's been apprehended or charged on it, certainly not. Mm. It is a, a mysterious one. I really like this question from Zayn Erasmus. Is it possible your book would have provided the accused time to muddle the evidence? In other words, that for all his fulminating about your book at the time, that it might actually have been something of a gift for Magashule in laying out the evidence against him? I certainly hope not. Look, there's always a very real chance. Like I think like kind of broadly in the realm of possibilities, it, it surely could happen, but I think it's very unlikely in this day and age. So... What they could have done before, and I mean, there could have been some sort of a massive evidence burning exercise on the scale of what we saw at the end of the apartheid era when you know, the, the apartheid regime burned documents mm. in Pretoria in their masses. So I think, you know, that luckily now we're in the digital era. So I refer to this ego files and these emails and stuff. That's all digital. That mm -hmm. all sits on a server somewhere. Um, waiting for a law enforcement body to go and subpoena and obtain. So it's, 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 it's going to be very difficult. Um, it's a lot of it's digital trails. Cash flows are digital. You know, the money flows through bank accounts and that sits there. And a, you know, a bank or banks have to release that information if a, a law enforcement officer presents a subpoena for it. Mm. So I, I don't think what, what they could have done is maybe sort of turned people who would have been candidates for becoming witnesses, maybe sort of putting that pressure, like if this matter ever comes in court, don't you dare mm -hmm. uh, think about turning against me and becoming a witness. So, so that could possibly have happened. But with the asbestos case, there's, there's just too much that's set in stone, kind of black and white documented evidence that's in the cloud and can't, can't be burned. And just to clarify, you were never sued for defamation by Mr. Makhachule. No. So, Ace, yeah, he was very loud about it, but it, it never came about. Mm, that is interesting. Did you feel under threat uh, after, at any point after publishing the book? I mean, given that we have had, you know, there are real life deaths of people linked to these mm. sagas. Uh, yes, yeah, I did. I did. So, just try, try to be extra wary almost. But mm. sort of like pre-publication was probably the unsafest, riskiest, and the most daunting part of it because I think like once the, the, the horse has bolted and something so prominently becomes part of the public record, it would be very silly for somebody to, to do something like harm a journalist after publication. But I was researching this book and traveling to the free state and meeting with people for a good year and a half, um, maybe two years if you add the, the months I spent working on, on these free state issues for my previous employer at, at uh, Media24. Mm. So those were some, some hectic moments, I must be honest, because you, you meet people in the free state and they people, some of them who walked very closely to Mahashule for many years, and they just kind of like they hint at or they they tell you that listen what you're up to now is is dangerous. Yeah. You're driving around you on your own in the free state. It's a province where people have died, people who are connected to or you know, have been rumored to be close to uncovering some of the corruption. 
Mm. So that, that definitely places some some stress on your shoulders. Mm. Here is a very cynical take from Ernest Lehoke. Poor gullible South Africans thinking Ace will get arrested. Let's face it, some dreams don't come true. I mean, just to clarify, Peter Louis, the Hawks have confirmed, have they not, that a warrant of arrest is going to be served on Mahachule. It just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and that's, uh, it has happened yet. So the warrant of arrest has been served on Mahashule and his lawyer, Victor Nkwashu. Um, so we're beyond that. I think what he might, he, he might be sort of alluding to, we shouldn't be naive about thinking that he, he will be prosecuted mm. or he will be successfully prosecuted, but uh, we passed that point. I don't know if he, yeah. So he's definitely, I mean, for all practical purposes, he has been arrested. It's just he, they, they've chosen the route where they allow him to go and present himself to the officer instead of them coming to him at a Tuli house or wherever and, and slapping cuffs on his wrists. And that's interesting in itself, isn't it? Because he was predicting in advance that there would be what he called these Hollywood-style arrests, that there would be this deliberate mm. attempt to humiliate him by publicly taking him down. Why do you think that the Hawks in the end chose a much more muted version of that scene? I think they are playing it safe. Look, I think they, they are aware of the, the sensitivities around this case and then all the noise around it. So, you know, they, they, in a perfect world, they, they shouldn't really. You know, everybody should actually be treated the same in front of the law because you know, they, they've already now gone and executed the supposed Hollywood-style arrests on Edwin Sodi and some of the, the, you know, the, the those other seven who were apprehended earlier on and given Mahashule a bit of leeway or, you know, treated him with kid gloves in a sense to allow him to present himself. But... We don't live in a perfect world. Uh, we live in a world where for many, many years in the South African context, politics and the law enforcement environment have been um, inextricably embroiled in one another's affairs. Mm. And it shouldn't be like that, but they are aware of political sensitivities. And I think they didn't want to give the, the critics of the MPA any ammunition to say that you are unfairly targeting our leader or the SG of the party, whatever the case might be. And do you think that that caution, what it suggests, is also that a similar caution will have been at play in building the case against Ace? We saw the first iteration of the Estina case collapse in court, and that was a real embarrassment, I think, for the NPA. Mm. Are we to take the fact that this has been quite a long time in the, in the making as evidence mm. that actually the ducks are in a row? Yeah, no, I don't think so. So I think like uh, kind of the 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 agreement to allow him to present himself, that's almost kind of like cosmetic. Mm. I think that the real kind of test would be how strongly and independently they, they are willing to examine the involvement and the, the possible criminal complicity of somebody like Mahashule in Estina, in Asbestos and all those cases. And I, I just don't get the sense that there's any special treatment in that regard anymore. Um, I think the NPA will charge people who for many, many years have prominently been embroiled in corruption scandals, regardless of who they are. And I think that's that's really going to start happening. And, and it, it has happened too. I mean, we have seen pretty senior people being arrested. Um, it's just the, the, the each time the, the, we're progressingly going up higher on another rung of that ladder as we as the, as the NPA progresses with its work. Right. Um, question from Colleen Dardigan. Would you be called to testify? If so, would you? So, no. No, that is inconceivable. It's I, I merely ex uh, executed my role as a journalist, as an investigative journalist, and published a book on these dealings. Um, I'm not, I wasn't embroiled in a part of the, the process of awarding that contract. I merely research it afterwards. Um, so uh, that, that would be a very surprising precedent if the journalist is asked to come and testify. I seriously, seriously doubt that. Mm. And I really hope not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lee Van Zayl, interesting comment. I'm worried about Jamila Batoy becoming overwhelmed with a mammoth task. Shouldn't they focus on securing convictions? Convict the low-hanging fruit first, Ace is going nowhere, and build from there. What do you make of that? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think they need to pursue cases where they believe they have a strong case. So if, if they believe they've got a set of documents and you know, other um, 
elements of the asbestos contract that implicate Mahashule, then they've got to prosecute when the case is ready. Mm. Um, the low-hanging fruit argument, I think that would only fuel the public skepticism of whether the NPA is actually kind of reconfigured and able to prosecute top-level corruption. They need to go after allegedly corrupt individuals regardless of how high up on the tree they grow. Yeah. I mean, arguably, it's an indispensable, essential message to prosecute someone like Ace Makashule, right? Because, I mean, damned if you do, yeah. damned if you do. There's been this outpouring of frustration from the public that the NPA hasn't been going after high hanging fruit enough yeah. now. Yeah. But definitely, yeah, there, there's, a, there's an image exercise here too. Uh, we can't we can't shy away from that fact. It it needs to NPA needs to mend or repair its image as a very broken organization in those years of eye capture, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Peter Luke, quite a lot of questions about um that you know eternal character of South African politics, Carl Niehaus. Um yeah. Carl Niehaus, why is he still around? Why is he still supporting Jacob Zuma, Ace Mahashule, and virtually anyone else accused of wrongdoing in the NC? Is there any evidence to suggest that mm. Carl has some important vested financial interests in these matters? I haven't seen anything yet, but it would not surprise me, to be honest. Um, but he really has become some sort of a cheerleader, you know, for the most <laughs> villainous or heinous political figures in this country. And I suppose that speaks to his character. Maybe that's just kind of the type of person he's drawn to. Um, but it also affords him some political relevance. I mean, because you know, broadly speaking, he's not really viewed as a serious person in the ruling movement. Um, and I think he, he has now carved out for himself a little bit of a niche position as a mascot for some seriously dubious characters in the NC. Mm. It's, it doesn't seem like a very lucrative retirement plan, but perhaps he has other stuff going on. Um, question from... <laughs> including killing off his mother and cl uh, claiming the, the insurance yeah. for the benefits. We must never write off the potential um, quirks to Niehaus's plans. Molefi Mlebone, how long do these kind of cases take before a verdict is reached? It could, unfortunately, it could take years. So... I wish we could have a sort of a legal expert jump in on this, but just speaking based on earlier cases, I mean, look where we're sitting now. We're sitting in 2020, and currently in the Peter Marisburg High Court, the state versus Jacob Zuma relating to the arms deal and Thales is still playing out since when were they first charged? 2005, I think. Right. So that's 15 years right there. Hopefully this one, it shouldn't take that long. Obviously, a whole bunch of developments fed into that case, the Armsville case being delayed for so long. But, you know, it's got the potential of being years, unfortunately. It could take a year, two years, three years. So, yeah, just once again, it's an old uh, adage, the wheels of justice turn slowly sometimes. But, but they at, yeah, they do turn. And it's still justice being done, I think. You know, it's still it's still it's it's still a, a very positive development because once again, regardless of, of how long the case takes, you know, finally at least that kind of person has been apprehended and charged. Yeah. Uh Steve Cooper asking a question which I think also relates to your other recent scoop, Peter Louis, which was about the health minister, Zueli Mkize's former role as the ANC Treasurer General. Mm. At what stage do you think the Hawks will have no option but to fully investigate the ANC's fundraising accounts? I think the, we've reached that point already. Um, I think we, we overdue for such a scrutiny or examination of the finances. So we, we just have too many pieces of information or revelations that point to the ANC having formally been a kickback operation. And that would have happened to the detriment of all of us. They mm -hmm. are privy to what happened at Madupi and Kusile, you know, where, where Hitachi was given a contract that she'd never have gotten to build those boilers and where a portion of it was siphoned off to Chancellor House for the ANC's benefit. 
that is a big, big uh, sort of one of our most prominent reasons for you know, believing that certainly somebody should be looking at the fundraising very closely. And then there's all these small little things. You know, I write, I write about it in Gangster State too, where Igor Bambani and Edwin Sodi, when the money comes through to them from the Free State's coffers, they forward it to the ruling party. There, there's so many instances where that occurs. You know, they for they, there's direct payments to the ruling party. Um, I show how it comes from the contract to the party. I show how Egon Bambani uses some of the money to pay for 19 NC youth league officials overseas joined in Cuba. Um, mm-hmm. and so, so many other cases of that happening. So if, if the governing party has become a criminal syndicate, because these are all crimes, it's money laundering, it's corruption then the, the Hawks, hopefully, surely, and the NPA should by now be sitting upright and, and examining that part of it. And we do too. We as civil society and the media have a right to see what's going on with party political funding. Not for the ANC alone, for the DA who's in governance in the Western Cape. We need to have a look at who's funding the DA, who's funding the EFF, who's funding the ANC. Um, and yeah, especially in the ANC context, definitely. There's just so many, so many, so many clues pointing to it having its fund- fundraising operation having become a fully fledged kickback system. Right. This is a sort of related question, also one that some of the state capture whistleblowers have raised from uh, Michael Tennyson. Do you feel that the FIC and all the banks have been negligent in uncovering the money trail? Do you think they're toothless tigers when it comes to? assisting with financial crime mm. prevention. I mean, the point that's often been raised is, you know, banks know generally what somebody's income is. Shouldn't yeah. there be raised eyebrows when suddenly one million, two million is landing in Peter Louis' bank account? Yeah. Look, so they do. I think they are kind of like two answers. I think one, the banks have certainly been way too lethargic in terms of ending their business relationships with obviously dodgy people the Guptas and all the rest of them, they were only too happy to to bank them and to benefit from that. So I think there's already complicity there. But either the banks, in terms of reporting these transactions, weren't as, um, you know, as negligent. So what happens is we have a system where the FIT Act forces you to submit a SAR, it's a suspicious activity report. The SAR goes to the FIC. So the FIC becomes a custodian of this vast database of dodgy financial dealings. The FIC doesn't have investigative or prosecutorial functions or powers. It has been feeding all of that information over all these years to the Hawks, to the NPA instead of other bodies. I think that largely is where the biggest bottleneck has been occurring. The banks have been feeding to, as they were, they are by law, they, they almost can't sidestep this obligation. They are by law required to, if a million rand bounces into the ANC's accounts suddenly, or if a million rand sort of comes to a contractor from a um, provincial government that it bounces to a third party account, just like that, without any apparent reason, mm. they draw up the SAR reports. And it does get fed through to the FIC. Mm. Somewhere on that level, FIC hawks. Um, the public is owed a massive explanation in terms of what is happening there at, the, at that bottleneck. Absolutely. Two sort of related questions. We're running very low on time now. Uh, one is from Ian McLeod. Any chance, well, what are the prospects of the return of the 230 million siphoned off through the asbestos scheme? And I think relatedly, Walter Stevens wants to know, do we know how much money ACE has to fight this in the courts? In other words, what is, do we know, is ACE rich currently? What is he doing with that money? What did he do with his yeah. alleged gotten gains? Yeah, so I'll tackle that one first. So I, I go to show this in Gangster State too. So a lot of it is so much cash driven. So, so many people who walked, very close to him in all those years, kind of describe how the cash comes in literally in cash. So there'd be bundles of cash. There's, um, on the record, Tavim and Yoni, you know, described to me how he goes to the Gupta residence with Ace Makashule. He's picked up, they take the road trip up, and Atul Gupta gives them cash. 
you know, bag of cash. So there's a lot of cash that was going around. So whether he still has access to that kind of cash, you know, the cash coming in, I'm not sure. Whether there is a heap of illicit assets out there, properties in trusts, maybe money is funneled to tax, uh, uh, tax havens, jurisdictions like Dubai or Mauritius. I'm not sure. That, that could also be a possibility. But there is cash there. So his daughter, who I view as a proxy for him, uh, she, she directly benefited from two very dodgy deals involving Ace directly. She certainly has some wealth because, you know, there, there was that 150 million rand RDP contract and the shell deal that, that has put some assets in her pocket, essentially. So maybe she's going to be asked to, to cough up for, for daddy <laughs> in this round. But yeah, that, that's also a possibility. The, the, the first question was the one about, you know, remind me. Hoping the cash that has been lost through the asbestos. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So the prospect is fantastic this time around. It's really good. So all those amazing properties and Ferraris and things we saw being confiscated, that is in relation to this contract. So there's a good chance that at least we'll get some of it back. Um, unfortunately, a Ferrari loses probably half of its market value if it dries off the show floor, but a massive number of vehicles and a property belonging to uh, Edwin Sodi and so on have been seized. So there'll be some funds that could hopefully be recouped and, and paid back to the, to the state. Perhaps this is a good note to end on from Martin Bagel. This is a most depressing webinar. Sorry that you feel that way, Martin. I thought we were being quite upbeat myself. <laughs> Will there ever be an end to the thieving and corruption in this country? I mean, I think it's, I, I've rarely felt more positive about um, the mm. prospect of justice than this week in particular. What, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, I, think, I think people do seem to have very subjective readings of it, and it's, everybody's obviously privy to their opinion, but I'm definitely kind of buoyed by what's been happening this week. Um, mm. we, we've all become so frustrated with very clear indications of corruption and then no movement, and then finally... There's this case where somebody as senior as, as, as Ace Shule does get arrested. So I, I certainly feel quite upbeat. I think it might be the start of many similar arrests for similar kind of offences. Finally, Peter Lee, there's quite a few people who have asked if you're able to say anything about what you are working on, what your next book might be on. Is there anything you can say in that regard? So I'm, I'm, I can confirm I'm not working on a third book at the moment. So... I absolutely relish and love my work at Daily Maverick Scorpio. And there's no shortage of work for, for Scorpio. I've, I've, yeah, very interested in what happened to the Prasa 3.5 billion rand contract and where that money ultimately ended up, um, especially considering new allegations involving Zulim um, Kize. Mm. Definitely keeping an eye on a number of Mahashule related free state issues and then one or two other loose ends. Thank you so much, Peter Louis. And I think from all of us in um, at Daily Maverick and also those of us who are concerned with law and justice in South Africa, thank you so much for your tireless work in tracking down the likes of Mahashule and his alleged um, financial <laughs> malfeasance. I think um, what you're doing is a, a really valuable public service and we're all very grateful. Your work. Thank you, Rika. I appreciate that. Thanks. Don't forget to all of you out there that if you would like a bit more of the inside scoop on the case against ACE, you can still buy uh, Peter Louis Myberg's book, Gangster State, which was published in 2019. There's been a question, Peter. Is there an ebook available? It should be. Yeah, I, I believe so. Ebook available too. We at Daily Maverick will be, of course, covering the appearance of ACE Mahashule in the Bloemfontein court tomorrow and we will have further analysis on the events from Peter Louis and the rest of our great journalists as it unfolds. And finally, another huge thank you to our Daily Maverick insiders. Some of you have corrected me. There are many insiders watching. Thank you so much. And to all of you who aren't yet Daily Maverick insiders, please consider becoming an insider, making a small monthly contribution, signing up on our website and helping support the work done by Peter Louis and the rest of our journalists. Thanks a lot and have a great week.